In this video, due to some popular demand, I'm going to tell you about 3D printing and wargaming. About a year and a half ago, I did a video about the secrets of GW's pricing model. You can watch it if you haven't already, because it's my most popular video up here. Pachow. In it, uh, I talked about GW and the pricing model, which is fine. But in the comments, there were lots and lots of comments by people. It's probably my most commented video, but a lot of them were saying, well, they better watch out because 3D printing is coming and I'm just going to 3D print my whole army and then they can see who's, who, I don't know. I'm not exactly sure what the end game is there, but the idea is that, uh, you know, we as gamers are going to start 3D printing our armies. Now, being a nerd, uh, dork, um, geek, whatever, I'm, of course, interested in gadgets and other kind of effluvia, and 3D printing is in that category. So when I started reading more about it and kind of uh, getting exposed to it uh, at a past job and things like that, I got more and more interested. And then about a month and a half ago, I pulled the trigger and purchased my own. And uh, so I want to tell you guys a little bit about it and how it relates to wargaming from what I've learned. So there's two main types of 3D printers, at least the type that you could probably get, you know, afford to, to keep in your home. There's filament and there's uh, stereolithographic, which usually is SLA, and then the filament. The filament kind is the kind that you're probably most used to if you've been paying any attention to 3D printing. It's uh, There's a long spool of a type of plastic and it goes into a machine which heats it up and squirts it out of a nozzle, kind of like uh, like, a, like a hot glue gun. You push on that glue on the back, and then it squirts out the little tiny nozzle that gets very hot, and then you get glue. But in this situation, you get cool stuff if you've done it right. There are two main types of plastics that go into filament machines. There's all kinds of different materials that can go in there, but there's two main ones that people generally use. There's PLA, which stands for something I don't remember, and ABS, which stands for something I can't pronounce. Uh, let's just kind of nail it down. ABS is generally harder and a little bit stronger. It's a petroleum slash oil based uh, plastic. And um, if you use it in your machine, your machine's gonna smell bad and your local environs are not gonna smell so great. It has a fume, it has a smell it gives off as you're producing the material. PLA, on the other hand, is uh, usually has a little bit nicer finish. It's not oil-based. It's actually um, cornstarch and like uh, cane sugar or sugar cane. I don't know. It's basically, I mean, I don't think it's edible. I've licked it, but I've not, it's not, it's not something I've, I've, you know, done several times, but I'm just saying it's made out of bio stuff and not oil stuff, which means it will break down in long-term sunlight, uh, water, you know, the elements, that kind of stuff. So you shouldn't use PLA to make something that you're going to keep outside. Uh, you'd want to use ABS or something like that. But for the type of stuff that us indoor kids do, it, PLA is pretty good. The other type of printer uh, that I mentioned before is stereolithographic. Now those are kind of space agey looking, to be perfectly honest. What happens is there's normally a, uh, a tub of a resin, and inside there are lasers that basically burn uh, the resin. The plate goes upside down into the resin. It burns on the underside and the material slowly gets raised out of the goop uh, because the laser is constantly making layer after layer. That's the whole trick about 3D printers. The way they work is layer upon layer. Whether it's the filament kind or the, the, the laser kind, you're either you know adding all kinds of plastic to build a thing or else you are hardening up the resin and slowly pulling it out of the goop. Resin printers like that, SLA printers, are generally far more expensive. You can get a okay P, uh, you know, filament uh, printer for about 200 bucks from Monoprice. Um, I can't find a resin printer for under $1,000, and a lot of them hover around three to four, maybe $5,000. Whereas a good uh, you know, filament printer can be, I mean, pretty good, I think, the one I like. It was like 700 bucks. 
So anyway, you make your decision and you've got yourself a printer, whether it's filament or whether it's the laser kind. And now you need 3D shapes. So uh, you need to be able to either create the 3D shapes and some piece of software yourself. You've got an idea in your head of a thing that you want to build. So you go and you, you, you use a piece of software. Uh, those pieces of software can uh, go anywhere from free. I use Tinkercad quite frequently, which is not only free, but it runs in a browser, so it's cross-platform and whatever, and it's on the cloud, so you could be working on it on your laptop and then decide to go sit at your desktop and all your stuff is still there because you just log into your account. Um, you can also do SketchUp, which used to be made by Google and is now by somebody else. There's a free version and a super crazy expensive version. There's Blender, which is also free, but has a pretty steep learning curve and is really actually aimed a lot more towards animation. But, you know, uh, there's a lot of different programs out there. Um, and it all depends on what you want if you want to go down that road of designing your own shapes so that you can print. Now, all of this is basically to get you some STL files. That's the instructions that give uh, uh, you know, the file the shape of whatever it is that you've designed. There's also OBJ files. That's another kind. But usually STL is what you hear about when you hear about people who are getting stuff ready for print. Once you've got your STL files, and you don't have to make your own STL files, by the way. There are plenty of websites, one of the big, biggest being Thingiverse, uh, that are basically just repositories for free STL files. People design something, throw it up there for free. And you can go through and do you know, like a, a, a word search and find, oh, this is really cool. And there's tons and tons of stuff on there. And you can find people who are remixing the stuff that's on there and changing it. You can find pictures of stuff that people have said, hey, I printed this and this is what it looked like when it came out and all kinds of stuff. Thingiverse is really cool. And it's all free. There are also people who will sell you specific uh, you know, STL files. And when we're talking about this, obviously we're talking about wargaming. There are companies out there that will make STL files directly for mainly terrain. They will sell you the file and then you can print as many copies of that piece of terrain as you want. So that's also something that you might find that you want to do, especially if you're trying to outfit like a big board. Okay, so now you've got yourself an STL file, whether you designed it yourself in some piece of software or you purchased it or you found it on Thingiverse or whatever. You don't just put your STL files inside your printer. What you have to do actually is now you have to use a piece of software called a slicer. And the slicing software is what writes the actual instructions that moves the head in the case of say a filament printer and, and, and lets it know how fast it should go and where it needs to turn and how much you know filament to kick out and all that stuff and it does it layer by layer by layer by layer for your entire design hence why they call it a slicer because it's it's basically sliced up your entire design and now it's made something at least the one that I use generally make something called G code so it's a whatever dot G code file I then take that G code file put it onto um, an SD card, and then I come down here into the Nerd Bunker, and I plug it into my 3D printer, and then there's a little tiny screen in the front of my 3D printer. I turn a little dial, I push a button, and then I go do something else for hours and hours because 3D printing is not like printing stuff out of Word or, uh, you know, it's it takes a long time. Even if you run the stuff quickly, it'll take hours. However, it's not as if you have to stand there and look at it. You don't have to do anything. It's kind of a set it and forget it sort of situation. I started printing some terrain last night. I found this really cool file on Thingiverse to make these, they're known as Texas barriers. If you've ever heard of a Jersey barrier, those are those concrete low and wide sort of barriers you see on the side of the highway. Texas ones are narrow and tall. So these are 28 millimeter Texas barriers. They came pre, you know, the file is already all beat up and stuff like that. And there are five pieces. So there's two that are mostly kind of sort of still intact. And then there's two here that are pointy and jagged. And this one's just barely a stump left. And it's the file. You just put it in there and print it. And then I went to bed. And this morning I got up and I popped it off of the plate. And I thought, yep, this worked out real well. I want another set of these. So I started printing again and I went to work. This was going to take five hours to print. These five pieces did it all at once, uh, but made five pieces. Now you may say, geez, that seems kind of, that takes a long time. But again, like I said, you don't have to sit there and watch it. You can just let it go. And it's pretty reasonable. PLA costs, the stuff that I've been buying costs 20 bucks for 333 meters. It's a kilogram of material. It's the 1.75 millimeter stuff. I'm getting it also again from Monoprice. And uh, yeah, so 333 meters, 20 bucks, that comes to six cents per meter. 
it will look as if I just did that math in my head. I assure you I did not. Uh, I had it already written down. This was um, 16.17 meters and five and a, and, a, and, and a half hours to print. That comes to 97 cents. So these five pieces here, which admittedly I'm going to have to do some sanding and a little bit of touch up and stuff like that before I paint them, it's a buck. So that's, if you have to out fit an entire table or say a whole bunch of tables. Let's say you're a tournament organizer or you own a store and you need a lot of terrain for tables. Honestly, it kind of makes sense to do something where you're using, I keep pointing over there because that's actually where my 3D printer is right over there. It's not a bad idea if you need a bunch and you can get away with a printer for relatively inexpensive. And of course the filament's cheap too. Now, as I said, you know, this, I printed this on normal quality, not high quality. High quality would have taken almost at least twice as long, if not a little bit longer to print and potentially used a little bit more filament. And I didn't really care that much because again, it's, it's a concrete block that's been shot at a whole bunch, but I'm still going to need to do some sanding to it. Um, there's a bunch of parts where it's like broken away on purpose to make it look. And for me personally, I'm going to probably throw glue a little bit of sand in there to give it a little bit more real life texture. And then when I pr prime it, I'm going to use filler primer. I'm going to use my favorite, which is Rust-Oleum filler primer, which is what I also use when I do um, MDF buildings. I did a, a video about MDF buildings quite a while ago and talked about the filler primer because it helps to seal the MDF so it doesn't soak in the paint. Another thing is a good couple of layers of it on something like this also helps to kind of get rid of the ridges and the striations that you get in the 3D printing process. If you want to watch that video about the MDF buildings, you can check it out up here. Pachow. Between all of these different things, a bit of sanding, a little bit extra touch up, um, and then the priming, I'll be painting and cranking these things out pretty quickly and then I've got some pretty cheap terrain. Like I said, 97 cents prints these five pieces. I printed them twice now, so I've got 10 for two bucks. That's a pretty good deal. A little bit of work and some, some primer and some paint. I'm going to have some nice pieces for my table. Now you're saying, well, uh, Uncle Adam, you know, earlier you said that, uh, you know, we're going to start printing all of our space marines and our dreadnoughts and all that kind of stuff. And then, so I, I think that you've sold me on the concept. I'm going to start printing my entire army that way. Not so fast. Number one, technically it's illegal. If somebody took a file or made a file that copied something that looks like something and there's gray area there. So that's really not the biggest problem in my opinion. If you find someone on Thingiverse and there are files on Thingiverse that are basically Games Workshop IP, well, if you find those things and you download them, you can print them, and that's great. I mean, you know, again, like I said, sketchy legally, but it's something you can do. The problem is, do you want to? One of the nice things about Thingiverse, like I mentioned, is that people can post pictures of the projects, so you're not just looking constantly at, like, this is what the, the 3D image of it looks like. This is what it looks like once I've actually printed it out. And because we're war gamers, we also want to know what it looks like once it's been painted as well. And uh, I got to say the results aren't great. Um, here's some images from Thingiverse of, uh, you know, a Space Marine Dreadnought that's been, um, you know, uh, printed out um, by a home printer and then painted. And, um, you know, I, I can put them up on the screen next to something, you know, like a nice product shot from Games Workshop so you can see the difference, but I shouldn't have to. I'm gonna, but I shouldn't have to. They're very chunky. They're very... There's those lines and all that kind of stuff. It would take a lot of work to make those lines disappear. There are different uh, chemical baths that you can use to help smooth the thing out a little bit. Obviously, you can sand. You can file a little bit with little files and things like that. But at that point, you know, I got to ask, is it, are you going to be really happy with the result? For terrain and things like that, 3D printing is awesome, in my opinion, because you can create things that you've got in your mind that you just can't use, make your hands do. But you can do them in software because it's easier. If you screw up when you're sculpting, you screwed up. But when you screw up in software, you can, frankly, you can control Z. It's, I just happen to think that I'm wearing a shirt. But you can control Z and then start and do it again and, and then get it right. And then when you print it, you've got a nice looking print and a little bit of work and you're good. But for the models, because they're so much smaller and all that other stuff, it's not going to work well. And it's going to be quite some time until home 3D printers are going to print you a nice looking 
little person, little figure, you know, 28 millimeter, um, it's going to be some time or else you're going to end up spending an amazing amount of money for a home printer. And then at that point, really, you probably you could just buy the models and save yourself a bunch of money and time. So in conclusion, is it cool? Yeah, I think 3D printing's cool because, again, like I said, dork, nerd, whatever, uh, into gadgets. But it, I can really see a lot of things that I'm going to be able to use for my terrain. When you're building terrain, I've always talked about how the embellishments, the little add things, things that you add on, which are generally the hardest parts to do, those things are really super important. And with a 3D printer, I can make window trim and I can make you know, air conditioning units and all kinds of stuff like that, print them out, use them on that. I can make barriers. I can make any kind of stuff like that for terrain. And I think it's going to work out well. I'll look into doing some other stuff for um, the actual figures themselves and we'll see how it goes. But for right now, I like, there's a lot to learn. Do a lot of research before you buy one. But if you do, I think you might have a good time. <laughs>